Welcome to Greece. This is the land where the great Apostle Paul experienced so many adventures. We're in the modern port of Kavala, which in Paul's day was known as Neapolis. It's here that he landed on his second missionary journey after having received a vision of a man of Macedonia who said, come over to Macedonia and help us. It was a deeply significant moment. The year was around AD 50, 20 years after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, and Paul was bringing the good news of Jesus to the continent of Europe for the very first time. The news of how his resurrection is the overwhelming proof that God has accepted his sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, making a restored relationship with God possible. Jesus had told his disciples after his mighty resurrection from the dead, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And Paul's arrival here was another major step towards the fulfillment of that prophecy. He was accompanied by Silas and Timothy and also by Luke who joined them at Troas and made the crossing with them. Activity on the quayside must be much the same as it was then, as the fishermen tend their nets and prepare for their next sailing. They're quite a reminder of the words of Jesus to his disciples that he would make them fishers of men. And that's exactly the business that Paul was engaged in. Paul and his companions must have had a favourable wind to complete their 150 mile journey in only two days. It took them five days on their return. This well-preserved aqueduct is a reminder of the town's earlier days. It carried water to the Acropolis which defended the old city. In Paul's day, Neapolis was at the eastern end of the great Roman military road which ran eastwards across the Balkan Peninsula from the Adriatic to the Aegean Sea. It was the most direct route between Rome and the east. At various places along its route, the massive paving stones can still be seen, worn down by the traffic of the centuries. Paul always headed straight for centres of strategic importance, and so he and his companions set off inland along this very road, the Ignatian Way, for about 10 miles towards their first destination. It's very moving to visualise Paul, the great apostle, and Luke, the great evangelist, together with Silas and Timothy, treading this very road. They could little have guessed just what dramas lay ahead. And down the road, is the great city of Philippi itself. How it must have appealed to Paul. His vision of planting the gospel in the key cities of the Roman world was emerging. Philippi was a base of empire. It bore the name of its founder, Philip of Macedon, the father of Alexander the Great. Philip was a ruthless militarist with an eye for a strategic position. And so was the Roman Emperor Augustus, more than three centuries later, when he founded a colony of discharged veteran soldiers here, in 42 BC. These Roman colonies were intended to be a sort of small-scale copy of Rome, and to represent it in the region in which they were set. And in the same sort of way, the Church of Jesus is intended to live by the values of heaven, its love, its justice and its peace and so demonstrate to the world God's reality and God's standards. Paul and his party stayed here for several days. In fact, almost certainly several weeks. His ministry here is one of the most thrilling chapters in all of Christian missions. In his travels, Paul always made first for the synagogue to proclaim the good news about Jesus. But here in Philippi, there doesn't seem to have been a synagogue from which to start. Instead, there was a place of prayer by the river, just over a mile outside the city gate. Luke tells us that the riverside congregation consisted of women. Possibly that's why there wasn't a synagogue. A quorum of ten men were needed before a synagogue could be constituted. So it was here at this tranquil spot that Paul and his companions joined the women for worship and sat down waiting to be invited to speak. One of the women, called Lydia, came from the very top end of the social scale. 
She was a merchant from Thyatira and specialised in cloth treated with a very expensive purple dye. As she listened to Paul's message, the Lord opened her heart to respond, to believe that Jesus is the Christ. She was baptised in this very river and she immediately invited Paul and his companions to her home. If you judge me to have been faithful to the Lord, she said, come to my house to stay. This type of Christian hospitality became an important part of the Apostles' teaching. Don't forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Lydia's home probably became the meeting place for the believers at Philippi. Lydia was the very first European believer in Jesus. And this beautiful riverside setting is still a place of meditation and prayer. The peaceful chapel alongside commemorates Lydia's baptism. Christian parties find great inspiration from remembering these events at the actual site. There's even an open-air baptistry for services of baptism. On one Sabbath, as Paul and his companions were coming to this place of prayer in these beautiful surroundings, Paul, in the name of Jesus, delivered a slave girl from an evil spirit, which enabled her to foretell the future. This ability had made a tremendous amount of money for her evil owners. When they saw that this source of income was gone, they were absolutely livid, and they hauled Paul and Silas before the magistrates. Here, in this very forum, under mob pressure, they tore the clothing from them and ordered them beaten with rods. It was a severe flogging, perhaps one of the several which Paul later mentioned. Then they were flung into jail. This purports to be the actual prison in which they were incarcerated. But although prison bars may stop you getting out, they can't stop God getting in. And so it was that in possibly this very jail, with their backs torn and their limbs aching, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. No wonder the other prisoners were listening to them. And at about midnight, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. The jailer was about to kill himself because he knew that he'd be blamed for the loss of his prisoners. But Paul shouted out, Don't be afraid, we're all here. The grateful jailer and his family believed in the word of the Lord and they were baptised that very night. The next day, the magistrate sent word to release the men. But Paul refused to go. He said he was a Roman citizen and had been humiliated. The frightened magistrates came to apologise, but they asked them to leave the city. And so they left behind, as the foundation members of the church here at Philippi, Lydia, the jailer and the slave girl, themselves representative of the entire cross-section of society, such as the unifying power of the gospel. Of all the churches that Paul founded, none were so near and dear to him as the church here in Philippi. You've only got to read his letter to the Philippians to see that it breathes an atmosphere of perfect love and mutual confidence. These were friends who'd often helped him and had not forgotten him now he was once again in difficulties. It's not surprising that in the years and centuries which followed, the church here, with its rich heritage of mutual faith and love, was to grow strong in its witness to Jesus. There's plenty of evidence of the strength of later Christian witness here. These crosses decorating the features of an early church. And this basilica, built around the year 550, is one of the most commanding ruins on the site. And this is the first Christian place of worship so far discovered here. It dates right back to around the year 312. This donor's mosaic inscription actually mentions Paul by name. And it reads, Porphyrius, bishop, made this mosaic floor of the Basilica of Paul in Christ. It's further dramatic confirmation of the impact of Paul's visit here. <laughs>
After all these adventures, Luke stayed behind here in Philippi. But Paul, Silas and Timothy set off westwards along the Great Ignatian Way towards the great city of Thessaloniki, or Thessalonica. Today's transport, by air-conditioned coach, makes the journey far less gruelling than Paul would have experienced. His party had to trudge these hundred miles on foot and in considerable heat, probably breaking the journey after about 30 miles at Amphipolis. Its ancient Acropolis still towers above the lonely road. And then on again to Apollonia before the final 40 miles on to Thessalonica itself. It's known as Salonica by many Greeks today and it's Greece's second city after Athens and still a very busy port. Thessalonica was founded about 315 BC and named after a half-sister of Alexander the Great. Alexander's statue is a major landmark in today's city. Besides commanding trade along the Ignatian Way, Thessalonica's harbour handled trade by sea across the Aegean. So not surprisingly, the city was a flourishing commercial centre. Its market is as vibrant today as it must have been through the centuries. If Paul, Silas and Timothy were to stroll the streets today, they'd find much of the produce the same as that to which they were accustomed. Thessalonica's White Tower, built by the Turks in 1430, features prominently in the guidebooks. Formerly a place of execution, it's in dramatic contrast to the promise of new life in Jesus, which Paul was bringing to the city. The coming of Christianity to Thessalonica here was really of tremendous significance. The city was the capital of the Roman province of Macedonia, and it stood on the Ignatian Way itself. So if the faith in Jesus could be firmly founded here, it could spread eastwards and westwards along the Ignatian Way, and the road itself could become a very highway for the progress of the Kingdom of God. The modern road still bears the name of the Ignatian Way. In fact, it's built right over it. But Paul would doubtless find it rather different today. And it's not only the road that's on top of the ruins of earlier times. As Thessalonica is still such a large and crowded city, most of it is built right on top of the ruins of the past, just as the road itself. So archaeological exploration is only possible in a very few areas. These are the ruins of the ancient Forum of Paul's day, now being not only restored, but actively rebuilt, and using techniques unknown to the original builders too. These arches were the typical entrances to the shops of the time. Paul would almost certainly have strolled along this very street. Unlike Philippi, Thessalonica had a Jewish community, with its synagogue, where Paul boldly proclaimed that Jesus was indeed the Jews' long-awaited Messiah. But, as visitors are reminded by their tour minister, The Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. The crowd, when they heard this, were thrown into turmoil, together with the city officials. To Roman ears, this claim that Jesus was a king, greater even than the emperor, would have sounded like high treason. And once again, Paul and Silas would have been in the very greatest danger. Another very ugly situation was developing. Driving up to the Acropolis, one passes through the narrow streets where the rumpus must have occurred. The buildings still have to conform to the architectural style of Paul's day. Jason and the others were released on bail 
but as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. One presumes for their own safety. And so Paul and Silas were driven on their way once again, probably with a legal ban this time against returning to the city. So was Paul's teaching about Jesus effective here? Well, today there are about 365 churches in Thessalonica, one for every day of the year. Pretty compelling evidence of the fruit of Paul's visit. One of them is the Agios Demetrius, the largest church in Greece. It was built to commemorate Demetrius, whose faith in Jesus would undoubtedly have come about as a result of Paul's powerful preaching in the city 250 years earlier. The oldest surviving part is the crypt, where, because of his faith, Demetrius was imprisoned, tortured and buried by Roman soldiers in the year 305. This is his actual tomb. He was just 20 years old when arrested, and yet he was faithful to death. The narrow passageway leads upstairs to the truly magnificent church. Such was the impact of Demetrius's martyrdom that the first church on this site was erected just eight years after his death, in commemoration of this faithful servant of the Lord, who was to become the patron saint of Thessalonica. It's marvellous to consider that all these splendours take place as a result of Paul's visit here. The faith in Jesus which he brought to the Thessalonians was to grow and take root in their lives, and it was going to be dramatically increased in the years to come, even in spite of fierce and cruel persecution. And so Paul, Silas and Timothy moved on 50 miles southwest to Berea. Paul's visit here is commemorated by this impressive monument, with mosaics illustrating events from his journey. The first shows him receiving the call from the man of Macedonia, who said, Come over to Macedonia and help us. The monument is on the actual site where, according to tradition, Paul preached to the Bereans. These Jews were more noble than those at Thessalonica, and they searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was telling them about Jesus had indeed been predicted. Many of them believed, and so did a considerable number of Greek men and women. Paul must have been thankful to experience a bit of peace at last, but it was soon to be shattered. When the Jews in Thessaloniki learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, they went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed in Berea. The men who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. Which route did Paul take from Berea? Well, Luke doesn't tell us. If he went by land, he could well have passed these extraordinary rock formations. Today, monasteries are perched precariously on their pinnacles. This strangely varied landscape at Meteora, southwest of Berea, has few parallels anywhere else in the world. The first monks arrived here around the 10th century, first living in caves before establishing these unbelievable bastions of peace. The atmosphere is of a tranquility which is almost literally out of this world. Such surroundings have inspired the creation of a wealth of artistic masterpieces. Now, how on earth did they get everything up here? Well, this is the windlass that the monks used to wind everything up in, in the net. Even, we have to say, themselves. They'd have needed a good head for heights. Such isolation from the world is all in dramatic contrast to Paul's experiences around here, a millennium earlier. Not for him such peace. He'd been flogged and imprisoned at Philippi, left Thessalonica in peril of his life, and now once again he'd had to flee for his life from Berea. Most people would have abandoned such a struggle, which seemed bound to end in arrest and death. But the thought of turning back never entered his head. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, was his motto.
Having left Silas and Timothy to catch up with him later, Paul found himself all alone here in Athens. Although its days of supreme glory were past, it was still the greatest university city in the world, to which men seeking learning came from far and near. It was a city of many gods. It's said that there were more statues of the gods here in Athens than in the whole of the rest of Greece put together, and that it was easier to meet a god in Athens than to meet a man. People met to talk in this great city square. In fact, in Athens, they did little else. It was a questioning, decadent city and academically snobbish. But Paul had little regard for such empty culture. He must have observed all the commercialization of knowledge and history, all the dishonesty and empty pride of a city living on its past. He was disturbed because the people of Athens were looking for truth in the wrong direction. Just imagine Paul all alone here, waiting for Silas and Timothy in this great city. All around him are the trappings of Greek history, culture and religion. How on earth was he to make any difference? There was the then all-glorious Parthenon, already nearly 500 years old in Paul's day. It was built to house the statue of the goddess Athene, an object of the very greatest devotion. West of it, the sculpted maidens, or caryatids, were used in place of columns on the south porch of the Erechtheum. Then there was the Panathenic Way, along which came a procession once every four years to present a new robe for the primitive wooden image of Athene. The procession made its way up the rock, through the great gateway and out onto the Acropolis itself. At the foot of the Acropolis is the Theatre of Dionysus, where the great dramas of classical Athens were staged. It's the birthplace of Greek tragedy, and not far beyond it, only 15 columns remain of the original 104 of the Temple of Olympian Zeus, which although begun in the 6th century BC, was only just being completed in Paul's day. The Temple of Hephaestus, the god of fire, is the best preserved of all the temples in Athens, because it was later transformed into a Christian church. The great Athenian marketplace, the Agora, formed the political heart of ancient Athens from 600 BC. Democracy was practiced here in the Bouloiterium, and also in the law courts and in the open air. These excavations of the Agora, which began in the 1930s, have revealed these vast remains of a complex array of public buildings and colonnades. The Stoa of Attalos, on its eastern side, was rebuilt in the 1950s using the original foundations and ancient materials. Today it contains a museum which reveals the great sophistication of ancient Greece. The building itself gives a vivid impression of the sheer magnificence of the city of Paul's day. Its cool colonnade also offers welcome relief from the heat of the midday sun. Paul took in everything, and all the buildings would have been in a similarly impressive state then. But in his day, all these temples, altars and images were no mere antiquities or works of art, but installations of an active worship, and false worship too. Paul was greatly provoked when he saw that the city was full of idols. So this time, instead of first going to the synagogue, he went to the Agora and set to work. Paul would have found little difficulty in finding someone to talk to, and the philosophers soon discovered him, possibly as he was nosing around in this royal colonnade, the Stoa of Attalus, observing all that was going on. Epicurean and Stoic philosophers took him to the Areopagus, the hill beneath the world-famous Acropolis. It was possibly on this very hill that the Areopagus, the traditional council of the city, debated new ideas among themselves or with any thinker who came by. So it was right here that Paul experienced one of the greatest opportunities of his whole ministry, the presentation of the gospel to the world-famous Council of Athens, the Areopagus.
he could scarcely have imagined that because of this speech, visitors would still be flocking to this site 2,000 years later, to this very hill, the Areopagus, the hill of the god Ares or Mars. Nor that here, beneath the mighty Acropolis itself, his words would still be being proclaimed as visitors are reminded of his most dramatic speech. Let's just think of that speech that he gave and remember what the message is, you see, because he's called up there and they say, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we want to know what they mean. Paul then stood up at the meeting of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. To most of Paul's listeners, this talk of a man being raised from the dead was absurd. It must have taken terrific courage to speak as he spoke, for it would be difficult to imagine a more scornful or less receptive audience. He probably thought that he had achieved very little in Athens. It had been slow going. In fact, he seems to have had less success here than anywhere else. A few converts, but there's no reference to a church in Athens in Paul's time. And yet, all around us today are churches to the risen Christ. Athens was later to embrace wholeheartedly the message which he brought. The Areopagus itself is worn slippery smooth with the footsteps of visitors through the ages for whom this rock is a vivid reminder of Paul's boldness in proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus in the heart of such a pagan city. At the foot of the ascent, the text of his address is engraved in bronze. And yet, at the time, Paul would have been amazed to know that his visit and preaching would be so well remembered. From Athens, Paul moved on to Corinth, another ancient and very great city. In classical Greek times, the temple of Aphrodite, or Venus, the goddess of love, had stood at the summit of the Acrocorinthus, which rises to a height of 1900 feet above the city. The temple prostitutes would descend at night to ply their trade in the streets below, making Corinth a notoriously immoral city. In 146 BC, when the Romans were engaged in conquering the world, Corinth was the leader of the Greek opposition against them. But the Romans captured the city and utterly destroyed it, leaving Corinth a desolate heap of ruins. All its Greek glory was gone, except for this Doric temple of Apollo, erected in the 6th century BC. The Romans equated the Greek gods with their own, and so their natural fear of the gods would make them leave the temple alone as they destroyed the Greek city. It's the only building of importance surviving from the period before that destruction. These seven surviving great monolithic columns still dominate the site. It's just incredible to think that when Paul arrived here, this great temple had already been standing for 500 years. The city lay derelict for a century, and then in 44 BC, Julius Caesar rebuilt the city on a majestic scale, and he refounded it as a Roman colony. This Roman Corinth 
quickly regain the prosperity which the Greek city had enjoyed. One of its strengths was its inexhaustible water supply, the spring or fountain of Pyrene. Its cool waters still flow today, splashing about in their underground cisterns as they have done through the ages. Less polluted then, we hope. There's enough left of the walls of the court for us to visualize the pool and fountains which fill the central space. There are marble seats in the shade for exhausted shoppers. Its very position made Corinth a key city. Greece is almost cut in half by the sea and Corinth stands on a narrow neck of land less than five miles across. Today, the Corinthian Canal, built at the end of the 19th century, carries shipping from east to west, while the north-south traffic crosses it by bridge above. So Corinth's position was strategic, with trade from north, south, east and west passing through it. In Paul's day, the sea voyage around the Southern Cape was so perilous that sailors preferred to unload their cargo on one side and haul it overland to the other. No wonder there were always dreams of building a canal. In AD 64, the Emperor Nero actually started digging the canal using 6,000 Jewish prisoners of war. But he didn't live to complete it and his diggings were destroyed in the construction of the present canal. Well, in Paul's day, this canal was a good 1800 years in the future. So Corinth's merchandise must have arrived either by road from the north and south, or at its two harbours from east and west. The Lycaeum Road led from the harbour to the city, and much of the produce of Corinth's markets would have come along it. The road leads straight to the Agora itself, and these steps up to it suggest that it must have been a pedestrianised area, no carts or other traffic to run you down. And what variety was on offer! Its markets could have been stocked with Arabian balsam, Egyptian papyrus, Phoenician dates, Libyan ivory, Babylonian carpets, Cilician goat's hair, Lycaonian wool, and Phrygian slaves, to name but a few of its attractions, all housed in these vaulted shops with their typical arched doors. Corinth was really at the centre of Greek and international trade. Paul must have immediately grasped its strategic importance. If trade could radiate from here in all directions, so could the Gospel. And yet, the influence of the evil past of the Greek city lived on in this, its Roman successor. It was associated in everybody's mind with immorality. But Paul was to summon the Corinthians to repentance and holiness, and to warn them that the sexually immoral would not inherit the kingdom of God. What a task! And right after his daunting time in Athens. He must have considered that his ministry there had not been too successful. It's one of the few places where no church was founded in connection with his preaching. He was depressed, and he seems to have moved on to Corinth in the mood of dejection and apprehension, not surprising after all his adventures to date. What's more, the blatant wickedness of the city was to prove the greatest challenge to his courage and preaching. It was here in AD 50 that Paul met Priscilla and Aquila a married couple who were probably already believers before they arrived here. They were tent makers, as was Paul, and so they shared the same accommodation and worked together here. They quite possibly occupied one of these very shops facing the Agora, the marketplace itself. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul refers to people buying meat which had first been offered to idols in the temple. This might even be the very shop. It's certainly the best preserved one in the street. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half 
teaching them the word of God. But this Jewish mission met with the same stubborn resistance as his previous ones, and it led Paul to take a drastic step. He shook out his own clothes in protest and told them, echoing the words of Ezekiel, your blood be upon your own heads. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. But Jewish opposition erupted again, and they brought Paul before Gallio, the new proconsul, who probably sat on this massive stone platform in the Agora. It was known as the Bema, and it served as a court where cases were tried. In front of the Bema, there's this wide pavement on which the angry leaders of the synagogue crowded round Paul. The Jews phrased their charge to look like one of treason. But Gallio made a decision not to hear the case any further, and he had them all ejected from court. His refusal to take the Jewish case against Paul seriously was immensely important for the future of the Gospel. In effect, he passed a favourable verdict on the Christian faith, and so he established a significant precedent. The Gospel could not now be charged with illegality because its freedom as a permitted religion had been secured as the imperial policy. As a result, Paul was able to stay on here for a full 18 months, enjoying great success. And it's from here also that he began another aspect of his ministry, writing letters to Christian churches in other places. It's from here that he wrote twice to the Thessalonians, and these letters are probably the earliest that we have from Paul. And so he left Corinth and set sail homewards at the end of this great adventure. Aquila and Priscilla accompanied him across the Aegean to Ephesus, that great city of the Roman province of Asia, whose ruins in Turkey today form one of the largest and most spectacular archaeological sites in the world. Even on this short stopover, Paul went straight to the synagogue to proclaim Jesus. The Jews asked him to stay longer, but he declined, promising to return if it was God's will. Little did he realize that on his next visit, he'd find himself staying here for three whole years, nor that this massive 25,000 seat theater would be witnessing a most dramatic incident as a result of that visit. On this occasion, however, Paul now said farewell to Aquila and Priscilla, and he set sail once again across the Mediterranean to report his progress to the Christian leaders in Jerusalem. Today, the Jewish disbelief, which he'd encountered all along the way, still persists after 2,000 years. Here, in the Holy City, Jews still pray for the coming of the Messiah, the very one whose arrival Paul had been announcing so ardently. How sad he would have been to see such a scene. Sad, but not surprised, because he knew that such disbelief would indeed be the case until in God's good time, the full number of Gentiles should come to faith. Then indeed, as the prophets have predicted, the Jewish nation will see in Jesus their true Messiah, and so all Israel will be saved. Meanwhile, Paul's invitation to faith in Jesus as the Son of God, the long-awaited Messiah, and the Saviour of the world, this invitation has resounded down through the centuries and countless millions from every nation, tribe, people and language have come to put their faith and trust in Him.